Chapter Five of Kabumpo in Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Kabumpo in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson. Chapter Five In the City of the Figureheads. It reminds me of something disagreeable answered Kabumpo as he eyed the flag. Nevertheless, he quickened his steps, and in a moment they came to a clearing in the forest, surrounded by a tall black picket fence. The only thing visible above the fence was a strange black flag, and as the forest on either side was too dense to penetrate, and there seemed to be no way around, Kabumpo thumped loudly on his centre gate. It was flung open at once, so suddenly that Kabumpo, who had his head pressed against the bars, fell on his knees, and shot Pompadour clear over his head. Altogether, it was a very undignified entrance. Oh, oh, now we shall have some fun, screamed a high, thin voice, and immediately the cry was taken up by hundreds of other voices. A perfect swarm of strange creatures surrounded the two travellers. The elegant elephant, took one look put back his ears and snatched pompa from the paving stones stop that he rumbled threateningly who are you anyway the crowd paid no attention to the elegant elephant's question but continued to dance up and down and scream with glee clutching kabumpo's ear pompa peered down with many misgivings they were entirely surrounded by thin spry little people who had figures instead of heads and the fours, eights, sevens, and ciphers hobbling up and down made it terribly confusing. Let's go, said Pompa, who was growing dizzier every minute. But the figureheads were wedged so closely around them, Kabumpo could not move, and they were shouting so lustily that the elegant elephant's voice was drowned in the hubbub. Finally, Kabumpo's eyes began to snap angrily, and, taking a deep breath, he threw up his trunk, and trumpeted like fifty ferry-boat whistles. The effect was immediate and astonishing. Half of the figureheads fell on their faces, and the other half fell on their backs and stared vacantly up at the sky. "'Conduct us to your ruler,' roared Kabumpo in the dead silence that followed. "'How do you know we had a ruler?' asked the seven, getting cautiously to its feet. "'Most countries have,' said the elegant elephant shortly. "'He's got no right to order us around.' said a six, sitting up and jerking its thumb at Kabumpo. Yes, but... Seven frowned at six and put his hands over his ears. This way, he said gruffly, and Kabumpo, stepping carefully, for many of the figureheads were still on their backs, followed seven. If the inhabitants of this strange city were queer, the city was even more so. The air was dry and choky, and the houses were dull, oblong affairs set in rows and rows, with never a garden in sight. Each street had a large signpost on the corner, but they were not at all like the signs one usually sees in cities, for there were plus and minus signs, with here and there a long division sign. I suppose everything in this street's divided up, mumbled Pompadour, looking up at a division sign curiously. Hope they don't subtract any of our belongings, whispered Kabumpo, as they turned into Minus Alley. Look, Pompa, at the houses. Ever see anything like em before? They remind me of something disagreeable, mused the prince. Why, they're books, Kabumpo. Great, big, arithmetic books. Pompa pointed at one. You mean they are shaped like books, said the elegant elephant. I never saw books with windows and doors. A lot you know, said Seven, looking back scornfully, but Kabumpo was too interested to care. Out of the windows of the big book houses leaped hundreds of the little figureheads, and they laughed and jeered at Pompa and Kabumpo. Ho, ho, yelled one, leaning out so far it nearly fell on its eight. Wait till the Count sees em. He'll make an example of em. What an awful country, whispered Pompadour, ducking just in time as a four snatched at his hair from an open window. But just then they turned a corner and entered a large, gloomy court. Sitting on a square and solid wood throne, surrounded by a guard of figureheads, sat the giant ruler of this strange city. 
"'What have you got there, Seven? roared the ruler. "'I am the elegant elephant, and this is the Prince of Pumperdink,' announced Kabumpo before Seven could answer. Pompadour himself could say nothing, for he had never before been addressed by a wooden ruler in his life. And that is exactly what the king of the figureheads was. An extraordinary school ruler, twice as large as a man, with arms and legs and a great square head set atop his thin, flat body. I don't care a rap who you are. I want to know what you are, said the ruler. We are travellers, spoke up Pompa, swallowing hard. Travellers in search of a proper princess. Well, you won't find any here, grunted the ruler shortly. We don't believe in em. Would you mind telling me the name of your kingdom? asked Pompa, somewhat cast down by these words. You have no heads, announced the ruler calmly, or you would have known that this is rhythmetic. He hammered himself upon the wooden chest. I am its ruler, and every inch a king-king of the figureheads, he added, glancing around as if he expected someone to contradict him. All right, all right, wheezed Kabumpo, bowing his head twice. I knew twelve inches made a foot rule, but I never knew they made a king rule. But could you give us some luncheon and allow us to pass peaceably through your kingdom? Pass through? exclaimed the king, standing up indignantly. We don't pass anyone through here. You've got to work your way through. Pass through, indeed. And when you've worked your way through, we'll put you in a problem and make an example of you. They'll make a very good example, your majesty said a tall, thin individual standing next to the ruler. He eyed the two cunningly. If a thin prince set out on a fat elephant to find a proper princess, how many yards of fringe will the elephant lose from his robe, and how bold will the prince be at the end of the journey? I don't believe anyone could figure. It might be done by subtraction, said the king, looking at the two critically. Great haystacks, rumbled Kabumpo, glaring over his shoulder, to see if he had lost any fringe so far. What have we gotten into? Bald, gulped Pompa, rubbing his head. Do you mean to say you take poor, innocent travellers and make them into arithmetic problems? Why not, said the thin one, who looked exactly like a giant lead pencil. And please address me as Count after this. Count it up is my name. What's the matter with living in a problem, my boy? Life is a problem, after all, and you will get used to it in time. I'll try to assign you to a comfortable book, and you'll find bookkeeping a lot more simple than housekeeping. This way, please. Please go, yawned the ruler, waving his hand. The Count will take you in charge now. And so dazed was the elegant elephant by all this strange reasoning that he tamely followed the lead pencil person. Goodbye, shouted the ruler hoarsely. Start them on simple additions, he said as they moved off. The street ahead was filled with figureheads, and as Kabumpo paused, they began forming themselves into sums. The first row sat down, the next knelt behind them, the third stood up, the fourth nimbly leaped upon the shoulders of the third, and so on, until a long addition confronted the travellers. Now, said Count it up in his blunt way, as you haven't figures for heads, let us see if you have heads for figures. Kabumpo pushed back his pearl headdress, and drops of perspiration began to run down his trunk. Prince Pompa, lying flat on Kabumpo's head, started to add up the first line of figures. Eighty-three, he announced anxiously. Say three and eight to carry. Say three and eight to carry, snapped Count it up. Here, three. A three stepped out of the crowd and placed itself under the line. I've got to be carried, cried eight, looking sulkily at Pompa. Carried? snorted Kabumpo, snatching eight into the air. Well, I'll attend to you. You do the adding, Pompa, and I'll do the carrying. He landed the eight head down at the bottom of the line of figureheads and swung his trunk carelessly while he waited for his next victim. So slowly and painfully Pompa counted up the long lines and Kabumpo carried, and if they made the slightest mistake, the figureheads shouted with scorn and danced about till the confusion was terrible. When an example was finished, the figureheads in it marched away, but another would immediately form lines ahead, so that it took them a whole hour to go two blocks. 
Oh, groaned Pomper at last. We'll never get through this, Kabumpo. Look at those awful fractions ahead. Can't I skip fractions, he asked, looking pleadingly at Count It Up. Certainly not, said the pencily man, stroking his shiny hair, which was straight and black and grew up into a sharp point. You shall skip nothing. That gives me an idea, whispered Kabumpo huskily. Why shouldn't we skip altogether? We're bigger than they are. Why? How are you getting on? At the sound of that hoarse, familiar voice, both the prince and Kabumpo jumped. You don't mind me asking, I hope. Clinging to the high picket fence and looking anxiously through the bars was the curious Cotabus. Have you found the greatest common divisor yet? Who's he? asked the elegant elephant suspiciously. Isn't there any way out of arithmetic but this? wailed Pompa, looking at the Cotabus pleadingly. He was too tired to mind being questioned. The curious beast was delighted to have this new opportunity to talk to the travellers. Will you answer a few questions if I tell you? asked the Cotabus, raising itself with great difficulty and looking over the palings. Yes, yes, anything, promised Pompa. Do you care for strawberry tarts? asked the Cotabus, twitching his nose very rapidly. Of course, said the prince. Oh, do hurry. Count it up. We'll be back in a moment. He had run ahead to arrange a new problem, and the rest of the figureheads paid no attention to the queer creature clinging to the palings. Are you going to invite the scarecrow to your wedding? gulped the Cotibus. I don't know any scarecrow, said Pompa. So how could I? Are you fond of that old elephant? The Cotibus waved at Kabumpo, who stamped first one foot and then another and fairly snorted with rage. All right, sighed the curious Cotibus. That makes my fifty questions. Hanging on to the fence with one paw, it waved the other backward and forward as it chanted. How many ticks in arithmetic? Tell me that and tell me quick. But if you can't, it's not my fault, so simply turn a winter salt. The head of the Cotabus disappeared. Now, isn't that provoking? gulped the prince, after it promised to help us too. I meant somersault, wheezed the Cotabus, reappearing suddenly. And if you can't, it's not your fault, so simply turn a somersault. It recited dolefully, and losing its balance, fell off the fence and landed with a thud on the ground below. Here, hurry along, scolded Count it up, prodding Kabumpo with a sharp pencil. The next is a nice little problem in fractions. I wonder if it meant anything, mused Pompadour, as Kabumpo approached the new problem. If you can't, it's not your fault, so simply turn a somersault. Anyway, it wouldn't hurt to try. Stop a minute, Kabumpo. Sliding down the elegant elephant's trunk, the prince put his head on the ground and very carefully and deliberately turned a somersault. At his first motion, Count It Up gave a deafening scream, fell on his head and broke off his point, while the figureheads began to run in every direction. Do it again! Do it again! cried Kabumpo joyfully. So Pompa turned another somersault, and another, and another, and another, till not a figurehead was in sight. Even the figureheads at the windows of the houses tumbled out and dashed madly around the corner. Before they could return, Kabumpo snatched up Pompa and tore through the deserted streets of Rhythmetic till he came to the black iron gate at the other end of the city. Butting it open with his head, the elegant elephant dashed through and never stopped running till he was miles away from there. Have to rest a bit and eat some leaves, puffed Kabumpo, at last slowing down. Phew! Wish I could eat leaves, sighed the prince as Kabumpo began lunching off the treetops. But never mind, we're out of arithmetic. Wasn't it lucky that Cotabus followed us? I never would have thought of getting out of sums by somersaulting, would you? Only sensible thing it ever said, probably, answered the elegant elephant with his mouth full of leaves. There's a lot more to be learned by travelling than by studying, my boy. Somersaults for sums, let's always remember that. Pompa did not answer. He slid down Kabumpo's trunk and began hunting anxiously around for something to eat. Not far away, he found a large nut tree, 
and gathering a handful of nuts he sat down and began to crack them on a white marble slab nearby next instant kabumpo heard a thud and a muffled cry the prince of pumperdink had vanished as if by magic where are you screamed the elegant elephant pounding through the brush pomper pomper he's disappeared gasped kabumpo rushing over to the marble slab there was not a sign of the royal prince of pumperdink anywhere but carved carefully on the white stone were these words please knock before you fall in fall in snorted kabumpo his eyes rolling wildly great gooch End of chapter five